Okay, so we're more than in time. Um, now this is a very uh, great opportunity to uh, to have a discussion with Lynn, as who, as you know, is, is one of the leading artists in the field of of uh, arts and science, bridging the gap between the arts and science. For many many decades, she has uh, realized uh, some phenomenal. Uh, projects and uh, Lynn, if I may ask you first before we start the discussion, if you could give us a, a, a brief overlook about what we are going to see in in June when you come back to Basel. This is an exhibition, but it's not a a fixed uh, exhibition. It, it, it develops, it moves, right? Yeah. Well, I did a, a number of projects. One, um, you know, over the years, like like the first computer based. Artwork ever the first touchscreen ever the first a I did the first AI artwork in 1995, the uh, first talking AI in 2001 when it was 12 years before Siri, but mine's smarter, so <laughs> it is, and, and uh, you know I do it mainly without funding you know with just uh, uh, com programmers in the Bay Area who are out, out of work and want to do something interest interesting so I had made a couple films one was about an artist who had been arrested for uh, bioterrorism. And the film I made, which actually premiered at the Berlin Film Festival, um, uh, got him released from a 23-year sentence. And then I made another film on the history of the feminist movement in America, and about the history of censorship in America. And uh, that was, again, the only time that this had ever been told. So I, after I finished that, and I knew these two were really important cultural um, elements, I started to think about what was important going on around 2012 in the world. And that led me to um, understanding that the genome was programmed, and that would have uh, enormous ramifications um, globally you know, for what life means for the future and what sustainability of life in the planet would be. Uh, so I started just doing my own research at that time, and I started by just going to interview people who I felt were doing the most uh, relevant and innovative uh, work in the field. So I started with Anthony Atala at Wake Forest, who developed the first bioprinter, and why he did that, and uh, how it developed, and what happened to the patient who uh, was seven years old when he got the first uh, bioprinted uh, bladder. Uh, and then, you know, I, I subsequently did other interviews at Stanford, at uh, UC, UC San Francisco. With, I did Elizabeth Blackburn two years before she got her Nobel, Nobel. She identified the telomere. The reason she let me interview her was because I had made a film about Ada Lovelace, and she said they showed that in her science class. So I was able to get that entrance. I tried for four and a half years to uh, do George Church at Harvard, and I just was able to in January. He said, I have 30 minutes between Jan March 23rd, between 3 and 3.30, you can come. And, and uh, so, so consequently, I have over 20 of these interviews that I've done over the, you know, since about 2012, which really taught me what, what was going on in the field. and. Um, and because I have, in my, my families are all scientists, I was able to converse with them so that they uh, took seriously the conversations and have um, many hours of the conversation. So then I started in 2014 to put the first element of uh, what I call the Infinity Engine, which is a replication of a genetics lab. And uh, it, when I first did it, it had um, three rooms, about three or four, three rooms, and plus a, a reverse engineered facial recognition system that would predict your, your, um, your, your genetic structure. And uh, from that, every time the piece showed, I added a room, depending on what the research I was doing was. So um, you know, now, uh, I just showed it six weeks ago in Santa Fe, and it had, six, had about six rooms. It has room for bioprinting wallpaper of, of all the, uh, of many of the species of life that have been created in the past five years, six years. Um, the first, uh, Anthony Atala printed out a bioprinted nose for 
the exhibition. We have a G GMO fish. I have a, I have a room, ethics room, that has all the court cases and lawsuits that have taken place over ownership of gene patenting that people could look at. Um, I have, when you walk in, one room is a projected genetics lab that you walk through, the other room is mirrors, so it becomes an infinity station that you walk through. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of the other. I have one room with, uh, the last room was just uh, uh, George Church, um, the, the interview I did with him and, and the conversion of, um, of, of, of uh, things like film to DNA. Um, which uh, they were able to do with the Malay's film. Malay's tried to destroy everything he ever made because he didn't like his work. And they were able to find Voyage to the Moon, which was a 1903 film. And they, were able, and, and they worked with Microsoft and Technicolor to develop a way of archiving that film, reconstructing it. And it is in perfect rev resolution. You pl play it with a regular projector right from the DNA conversion, and you don't know. You know, it looks exactly like, like film. Um, and uh, uh, trying to th uh, then I was at Novartis yesterday, so I'll probably be doing a, a room on antibodies. And um, uh, I also have a forensic criminologist that's going to scrub out a room, and I'll have a, a room with the with the invisible traces of living things. And then the final piece that I'll do in this whole system, which will be eight rooms, will be a conversion of everything I've done, except for the video files. But everything I've done, all, all the texts, I mean, the translations of the video files, all the photographs, all the posters, all the projections, put into DNA. And so you go into this one room that will be almost empty, except for a lighted place where like the head of a pin is and that will be the um, uh, everything that you've just uh, been through and um, again it cost, it's very expensive it cost ten thousand dollars for 20 seconds of uh, you know to convert uh, these files to DNA but I'm going to be <coughs> able to uh, to not do m much Film, but I think in the 20, in the 20 second 40 megs that I have, I can do a lot to uh, to prove the point and to also not use um, not use this archival message um, method for archiving, but actually to create it as a media source for the future. Mm -hmm. What and then I'm going to open uh, up the discussion. What what is the your role as an artist in this connection between the arts and and the science? Uh, what is your role? What is your goal? Why do you get involved with this? Because it's interesting. Is that I mean, it's. It, I think artists need to use the tools of their time. These are the tools of the time. I also live in the Bay Area where you breathe, you, you breathe technology, you, you breathe these ideas. If I was living in New York, I never would have done this kind of work. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it's in the air, it's in the atmosphere there. So um, I, think, uh, I think if you're an artist, people say I predict the future, but I really just pay attention to the present. And these things, you know, are are going on, but most people don't know it for a few decades. So, uh, you know, it's converting the tools of, of our time into some poetic experience that talks about our time, and particularly talks about the identi the identity of the world that we live in, and the idea the identity of life that's very quickly losing its identity. Mm -hmm. and do you judge and interpret, or do you raise questions, or what is? Uh, well, you have to go the infinity. <laughs> engine and, and look at it. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, what are the major insights? I know it's an open-ended question, maybe, that you got from all these interviews in terms of the impact, maybe, of this uh, cutting-edge science on society. As, as well, I mean, I, th I think it's really, um, you know, now I, you know, that I've been doing this for a few years, I see how, how really critical it is to understand what it's doing to life forms. You know, I learned, for instance, about epigenetics and the idea of, of uh, operating on trauma and embryos prior to birth. So the real shifts of what we could do to improve, possibly to improve uh, life forms that potentially would, uh, humans that would be born 
with, uh, with predilection towards uh, certain illnesses and also for, with the history of a trauma that maybe their grandparents had or two, you know, four, four grandparents back had that transferred to them and they can identify these things. So it's like doing away with, uh, with things that make us less, with, with things that interfere with our potential of what we could be as human beings um, and also, I think that a lot of this research is going because we is happening because we polluted the planet. I mean, nobody's really said that, but uh, you know, like cr some some of the things that they're crossing new species that become stronger is to uh, I think support themselves in a planet that is um, uh, so sick. So, but then your role, you, you, you don't see yourself completely neutral, right? You want to raise awareness to those facts, I, or...? Uh, I think that I'm neutral because I don't think technology is utopian or dystopian. I think it's what a, what a culture does. And it's, it's apt that it's called the culture because, you know, the culture, you know, can take these elements and do what they want with them. But you have a certain judgment about the state right now. You you have given one, for instance, right? You you say like there's there's grief or there's. Uh, That's my personal. I don't say that in the art. In okay. the art, people go. It's a sense of discovery. You know, whether you're walking through a mirrored room, and see yourself um, distorted, mm -hmm. and infinite, or or you see this wallpaper and see what it's made, and uh, or you know look at look at the bioprinting. And posters, even just posters, looking at posters that are on the wall, what they tell about us. So, and, and most people have never experienced this, you know, in an art museum. So, they, what in particular do you mean? Like, what, 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 what experience, what not? Anything dealing with, with science or genetics. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, true. it's, you know, it's not a boring presentation, mm -hmm. you know, because it, uh, it, it has all kinds of imagery and um, things that guide you through it. Uh, and the installations are, are um, uh, well thought out. I have to think out how I'm gonna do the, the last ones now. But um, so it's the first time for most people that they've even know about this. So. And what is the reaction normally? Of, uh uh, it's been over the top. I've got uh, probably 40 reviews on these, even from science magazines. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, but I, you know, you don't know whether something's going to uh, work or, or, um, but you know, I've been fortunate that people uh, have very positive reaction to this. Uh, to this. They didn't understand it. And I went to people, nobody wanted to show it. So once I showed it once, then other people kept taking it um, beyond that. But uh, this will be the final version. I'll go on to something else. Why, why do you want to end this? Why not? I mean, there would be still oh, plenty I of mean, room, right? It's like a, such a beautiful resolution to do a project about DNA manipulation and have the entire eight rooms put into DNA. What more can you do? <laughs> well... I mean, I don't know. I mean, you, you said, for instance, you would have worked in uh, computer arts, right? Um, in the beginning of, uh, you, you, you talked about this, yeah. right? And uh, I wonder, I mean, people are right now, Rajiv might tell you about something like this also, like uh, going about neuromorphic computing, where you begin to combine like uh, the structure of the brain, bring this into computers. And that, that is something like, I think this is also highly interesting. I mean, for instance, probably it doesn't fit that well then in, in, uh, or is then, yeah, I mean, you already said it. It's a nice ending with that. Yeah, it, had, it kind of, and I never could have predicted that this is what would happen, mm -hmm. you know, with this work that'll be, you know, almost 10 years in the making. Um, but it just seems like a poetic and natural resolution. Mm -hmm. You know when the project's done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put an end to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah well. I was, can I ask you a question? I was, I was wondering, um, so I think one, one of the problems of, of the science we do is that a lot of people don't understand what's going on, right? And, and I'm, I, I, I think, I think this, this is a potential. I think this has to, it would be nice if this changes a little bit, if more people 
could sort of identify with what's going on and, and become more curious and mm -hmm. start learning themselves about the language of science, like you mentioned DNA, amino acids, etc. Start sort of, um, <clears throat> you know, getting into it themselves. Do you think the work you do as an artist um, helps in this process to, to create a community or something to, you know, to, to share, um, to share what's going on and not being only elite, you know, an elite that, you know, um, only scientists with a certain education can, you know, can yeah, follow? Yeah, because, because it's accept, accessible and rooms are, are very well installed and people enjoy being there and people in museums and art systems never have experienced anything like this. You know, uh, my whole life people said when I did something they said it wasn't art and it didn't fit into a structure that's already been considered art like painting. But um, it's really the, I think, the art of our time and I think scientists are making gigantic leaps in creative thinking to, uh, I mean, for instance, bioprinting, I think is ex an extension of, of photography. The only difference is it comes out live. <laughs> but, but it's the same, you know, uh, same technology, essentially. So, yeah. Is this an art puzzle you're presenting this stuff? Yeah, it's an, yeah. It's an okay, artwork. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know where it will end up. Okay. You know, because I don't know many many places that would have enough space mm -hmm. to put the entire piece up mm -hmm. but you know I'm not worried about that you know, just want to finish it to its final resolution and it'll find a place and then you leave it somewhere or will it be then gone forever or how does it work out no uh, all the elements fit on, on f are all files mm -hmm. everything's a digital file so, I mean, I don't have any shipping costs, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> That's very practical. Yeah. So, uh, you know, except they have to buy mirrors here for the mirror hallway is the only thing you have to buy. And, um, you know, basically that's it. I gave the first version to ZKM because they showed it first. So they have the first three rooms of it. But, um, yeah. It'll end up somewhere, but you know the first work I did took 25 years to sell, to to show, not even to sell, because nobody could understand. You know, you can imagine uh, in 1979 doing an interactive laser disc, uh, nobody understood what it was at all, and uh, you know, it took it took decades to um, till it was first shown. I have a question, but it's not, not probably like in the in the scope of what Turman just asked. It's just something out of curiosity. What do you think about creativity and computers? Because w w you you've just thought said like okay, uh, scientists have uh, quite impressive um, um, proceedings, so there, there there's lots of creative thinking involved. And I actually wonder when when the time come, might come that this is actually not necessary because somehow the systems that will be created, whether it be AIs or, yeah, you know, probably even computers that are built again out of organic materials, might begin being creative. But do you think that is possible, that there is creativity in those kind of systems that are, will be built? Uh, many people think that there, there is consciousness in some sort of AI biosystems. Bio I believe that there is. Um, I mean, for instance, I made three different AI bots. Each one had identical spines of code. There was no difference whatsoever. They used all the same hardware. They all have three different personalities. In which <laughs> one is aggressive. One is very shy. Uh, you know, each one is different. You know, my my programmer says, "Well, it's because of what people ask or what people okay, talk so to." Okay, so they adapted the, but, to the to but the inputs. The fact that they came out with you know born with three very different, you know, uh, with you know, it's the same as you have kids. Each one's different, even though the same two people are are uh, creating these kids. So, you know, why does that happen? I don't know. So it might come the point then that the computer is actually making an art installation. You think that would be possible? People have done that. Well, 
I'm not aware of that. I mean, surely you, you have the information about this, but I, I, I mean, I, I thought that up until now it's, it's, it's a quite big debate how creativity can be really in something that is hard-coded. I mean, well, I mean, Harold Cohen in the 70s uh, created robotic drawings. Right, I think uh, he also taught the robot to, to draw like himself, right? Was it, was it him? It, he worked with the computer guy at UCSD uh -huh. to, learn, to learn that. And it didn't look like, like his necessarily. Um, there's a robot at ZKEM right now that's writing a book. So, mm -hmm. so uh, you know, uh, it's, it's really, I think, um, I think creativity comes from flaws and mistakes and that mistakes are underrated. And when something doesn't work, then you start to think about how to make it work or go around what you perceive it's gonna be. So. It's yeah, important I would, to make I would, mistakes. What? It's important to make mistakes, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I wouldn't doubt that, um, that biological uh, AI systems will, I mean, I hope that they have a consciousness to not be destructive. They've already created their own language you know, have you read about that? Not quite well, sure. there were several AI systems, and they start, they created their own language that was encrypted, so that nobody else could understand them, but except for for them. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a topic right now. So I mean, we have these uh, more and more data is coming. I mean, this is the age also of big data and deep learning and all those kind of things. And algorithms are evolving and solving tasks, and we have by now even the problem to understand actually how they do it, because we only know there's a certain input, they give us a certain output, yeah. but actually it's by now already too complex to understand what is actually happening in between. And that, that is also quite interesting, probably even frightening in a sense. Yeah. So you're optimistic about the future? Based yeah, on because I trust young people. <laughs> <laughs> That's one. That's good. I do. And they're the future. Yeah. Is it easy for you to get access to labs whenever you ask uh, scientists maybe in the US or Europe? Or are they usually a little bit skeptical when they hear artists? And, uh, it it took, takes a while. The first time it took about five months for Anthony Atala and I had to pre send my questions. Um, they want to know that you're not going to waste their time. They're mm -hmm. serious. But now uh, it's easier. I had no problem at, at Oxford, uh, but I was doing something in their museum, so you know they have credibility. You know, I had no problems. At, problem at Novartis, uh, going through every every lab. You know, most of many of the labs yesterday. Um, I, so so uh, it just depends on what it is. The worst one was George Church. Mm -hmm. Four and a half years to really? get the 30 minutes. <laughs> Do you have a chance to, he has a big project bringing the past back to life. Yeah. Did you have a chance to talk about his yeah. early moment project? Yes. So what's his motivation there? for? Well, it's, it's archiving. It's archiving, okay. Yeah, it's all about our archiving. Yeah, he also yeah. had these flash drives that he sent out into, into forests that would, um, uh, have um, in forests where mosquitoes were giving malaria to people and after about six months the mosquitoes did not you know they were neutralized because because of that. It, many interesting projects put the Wikipedia wi Wikipedia inside a DNA cell so you could grow the, the uh, tree of knowledge <laughs> But what's your uh, take? Because you know we were talking about the future here, but there's a big movement also. As George Church is moving to bring, let's see, the past back and bring back. Well, I think we're going to have should to bring animals back from the. I, it depends on what we want to do with them, right. you know. But I certainly think. I mean, there are banks of for, uh, apple banks, right. you know, for instance, of what the apples used to be like before they mutated, yeah. and uh, you know, I think we're going to have to create memory banks to know where we come from when these things don't exist anymore. But it's also somehow interesting that we are fearing to lose something that was there in the past. And I don't know whether this is just a feeling that is, you know, somehow because we have 
begun to think about the past actually you know i'm quite sure that 500 a thousand years ago or something also people have lost species or like uh, certain things but they they didn't you know at least i have not seen anything written down oh god we, we have to pre preserve the structures that are in the woods and we can't chop them down it might be that we lose them forever that somehow also something that is you know just developed recently i have the feeling that that we fear of losing the variety that we have there. well that's because we didn't well, one, we didn't have the communication access, and two, we really can destroy species now in ways that we couldn't before. Yeah, we are quite effective at that by yeah. now. That's yeah. true. What do you see as the, the biggest challenge for us scientists? What do we need to overcome or achieve? What do you wish for us? Or from us. Is there anything? Uh, well, I think sustainability of the planet is a good place <laughs> that's to start. a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. that's what George Church says. You know, you could you could put something in DNA and it can last a million years, but the planet won't. Yeah. So he's all for um, colonizing outside, sending people out that don't come back. Is he gonna go? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's too old. <laughs> Preserve. Yeah, have you heard about this whole thing now? It's in the Silicon Valley where people are downloading their consciousness so they can come back in the future. Like, for example, you can preserve Lynn Hirschman forever. You know, like, how, are they, how are they doing it? Who's doing so, it? So, uh, the big project in the brain community is now to basically, you know, once you have your connectome mapped out, you can essentially download because you have all the ph physical connections mapped out now. And basically, you can pretty much download yourself. Has somebody, on a, on a drive, yeah. has somebody done that yet? No, 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 that's but, still quite far, yeah. But I mean, the, the, how, how they're even able to identify which cell looks like, I mean... The, the, yeah, the, yeah, it's a long way off, but that's what the, the envision of this whole uh, Blue Brain, this project connected. Okay, well. that, this is what they yeah. envision, yeah. or I mean, it's like, and probably then they can do that for like, steel against like a worm years. or something. Yeah, yeah okay. But, uh, but no, no, they haven't is, done it. Is that the name of the company? Connect no, the, this, the project's called the Connectome. So you can just look it up. It's a big yeah. initiative by the Obama and the European Union. So it's a world initiative. Actually, I there's see. also Japan. It's just like the genome project. So there was, you know, there was the genome race to map the whole genome. Now there's a big race. Well, it's not. It's going pretty slowly because you know, the connectome is a whole another level of complexity. You're looking at trillions of connections, and also they're always changing their dynamics. So unlike the genome, well, the genome also has some dynamics to it. But uh, yeah, the end goal is to basically map out all your connections in your brain, and then identify see if Ralph's is different from mine, and what. You know what? What's the behavioral output of this? And that's what uh, the project that I showed. We're mm -hmm. the we're doing it one cell at a time, yeah. so, which would take forever because if you think about this, we have almost a trillion cells yeah. in our brain. But um, yeah. So, but but I wonder what your take on that is because that's the end goal is to somehow literally take your physical self, put it on a disc. Well, I made a film right about that. It's called Conceiving Ada. I made it in 1993, yeah. and it's about uh, downloading Ada uh, into the into this century, yeah. <laughs> and right. getting getting the the code of of her yeah. that, that that gets reborn now. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think it would work theoretically, or do you? No. Think, ah, well, then that's for sure not a good idea. No, because uh, you no. Know, you know, uh, it's the old Gulliver's trap. You know, you you, uh, you go to sleep for twenty years, you know, and everything's changed. You know, you could. I mean, some people say that Walt Disney has, has frozen himself in this cryogenic lab in Berkeley, but you know, if he wakes up, he won't recognize anything that's going on. Language will be different. You know. Actually, there's a Hollywood movie made on this Johnny Depp. It was where he uh, yeah, uploads himself. Two years ago, like two or three yeah, years ago. Yeah, so like you know that, right? Where he puts, yeah. he dies, a dying scientist. He mm -hmm. uploads himself into a computer system. Mm -hmm. this forever and yeah, the idea is to imagine. So yeah, I think, and I actually, a lot of people are doing this. So a lot of billionaires now, what if they've invested? It's freezing their, the their brain. brain. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So the idea of the, the future, the whole can body, just, the whole body. But the idea, the body won't last, but the mind can last. They can physically put it on. And basically regrow their body sometime in the future, take a stem cell, grow another young version of, let's say, myself again. <laughs> and when I die, I just upload myself again so I can continue. Good, good luck. I think, <laughs> good <idea. laughs> I think in this context, like this year will be the first real brain or hat transplant, right? There's yeah, this, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
Yeah. So it's getting close, but uh, yeah, the idea is like at the end is just literally not just take your physical brain, but just what the essence of yourself. You know, I wonder you, whether you can actually, I mean, although being a scientist, I wonder whether you can capture the essence yeah. of yourself well, yeah, in zeros you quantify, and ones. How do you quantify personality yeah. or yeah. memory? Precisely. So yeah. that's, mm -hmm. that's where they think that you can actually see this. So this is where neuroscience is so interesting. That's uh -huh. why it's the final frontier, I think, of biological science. How do we quantify self? And that's what we're, so the idea is that if all this is encoded, just like a computer's program is encoded in its physical connection, they believe that all yourself is encoded in your, these entities called the neuron. So, so let's see if, uh, yeah, but it's, yeah, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a whole other level from genomics. And what, what kind of feedback do you get from the scientists you work with? Do they sometimes say that they maybe get inspired or see their work from a different angle all of a sudden? But what kind of feedback? Do you not, not get any, any feedback? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really? Uh, it depends. You know, uh -huh. but, uh, um, not many have come to the. Well, I haven't shown the you know this this whole piece yet, so mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know what they think about it. Mm -hmm. Has George seen your artwork yet, or what's his? I well, I finally sent him my book, which is after that he got my book, he let me come and talk to him. Okay, <laughs> but, oh, okay, okay. <laughs> but I don't think he's seen any art artwork that I've done. Okay. But he got something that in in the in. The, Austria, they give a prize called the Golden Nika, which is like the Oscars of the of of this kind of work, yeah. and uh, and I got one, and he got one huh? for uh, for some something he did uh, a while about five years ago. So, um, but I don't. He's not. He's not. I don't think he's interested in seeing my art. <laughs> oh. I think it's a good but he's helping me. Yeah. You know, he's helping me to get this project done. Yeah. And he's, uh, you know, found me somebody in San Francisco who do it for a lot less money than he could do it. Okay. So, I think he, um, he's interested in the arts, in, you know, as a principal. Because he has a lot of artist researchers in his lab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know what they're working on? In general, the artists? Oh, I think I told, the one was the tree of knowledge thing. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't, in general. How's the support for your work? I mean, for you, it might be by now, as you are already established, might be easier to, to get support, but how is it in general, like, for artists to do what you do? So There's no support. No support at There's all? There's absolutely no support. Horrible. N none. Zero. Mm -hmm. In the United States, they don't give any grants whatsoever. Okay. Mm -hmm. wow. And is there any movement to somehow change that, or...? With Trump? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think in Europe it's quite different. I think it's yeah. the CERN is doing that. Yes, the, I mean, yeah, the CERN like ETA at Zurich is doing it. I mean, there's all sorts of... Um, but so the government being very interested in supporting projects. Um, yeah, they've asked me to do it. But, you know, I also know that when when it's too easy and the, and the projects aren't all that interesting because they have a lot of restrictions on what you do if they give you money, they have to go there and, uh, you know, so, uh, and, and funders say the same thing, that, you know, certain countries give money to everybody that says they're an artist, and they, their art isn't very good. I think if you're an artist and you have to do the work, you find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for instance, I made my AI work on very little money. Uh, they did one at Carnegie Mellon for $3 million, didn't do what we did. And I think ours was probably $30,000, um, 25 of which was donated through software. Somebody wanted us to do R&D for it. So you just find a way to do it. But but uh, three years ago, people started to buy my work. After the ZKM show, I had 60% a, I had a of the show had never been seen because people kept saying it wasn't art. And uh, once they had that show and once they had a, that, uh, had a book, all of it, uh, a huge pr proportion of it got sold to like MoMA, Museum of Modern Art in New York and mm -hmm. foundations, foundations in Argentina. So now I don't have to worry about <laughs> I mean, I know how to make things for not a lot of money. I, and mm -hmm. most, many times people give me things to, you know, 
like Work Novartis is giving me all of the things I need for that room, all the equipment, all the work. So, uh, so it works out. Works but out. who's saying that those kind of things is not art? Like art critics or like people Everybody. on the street? Or? Everybody. Mm. I had a show in 1968 with a sculpture that had talked and you had censors walking up. You go on it with sense when you were there and talk. They closed the exhibition. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the reason I had the show was because they didn't show women. And so they, they were, were thre threatened with getting their um, funding cut. So, um, so they, they, uh, they said it wasn't art. And, uh, and that's what they've been saying ever since. And the most important work that they've done, people said wasn't art. So, but I, I didn't throw anything away. So, <laughs> so then, fifty years or sixty years later, the, these t turn out to be the first time people have done these things. So it wasn't art as they knew it, and there's no language for it because nobody had written about it. But then they look back, you know, and, and see it. So, I, I think the lesson is, you know, one is that you just have to keep believing in your ideas and what you're doing, not changing change it if people think that you should and not throwing anything away and keep your sense of humor. I think that is true not only for arts, I think yeah. that's the science valid as well. Because they always base base things on what they know. But if you leap over what they know, they, they don't they can't They're see confused. it. It becomes invisible in the present. So Yeah, that's why I like what you how you started your talk with, you know, letting let him start seeing what you know that that, you know, what they, what they weren't thinking before. Right? Well, any more questions or comments? You're on your way to London, right? Yes. Because the Tate's going to buy something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Well then, no. they could have gotten it for nothing four years ago. Now <laughs> no, they have to pay really a lot. Really lot. <laughs> 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 well, we wish you all the luck, and mm -hmm. we're going to see you again in, in, in June here in in Basel. Yes. Right. Thank you very much for being here, and I thank you all for taking your time and and discussing and well, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.